Okay, so thank you very much indeed, Marcus, for agreeing to give a talk to to the RSB local regional group. And um, if you would like to take it away now, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, so this talk is about uh, brain connectivity. So as an introduction, I'm uh, based in computer science, but my background is studying biology and computer science. So it's like both backgrounds. Um, I'm also visiting professor at Shanghai Jiao Tong University Medical School. Uh, to develop computer models, how to treat patients based on this uh, information. So I look at the connectivity of the brain, and this is now also, oops, I have to go back in here, um, part of the Oxford English Dictionary. So the term <laughs> connectome means the, um, the network of uh, cells or network of brain regions to see how different parts of the brain uh, are connected. The term was proposed in 2005 by Olaf Spons. And actually we could have proposed the term earlier. We had a review article in 2004 where Olaf already suggested the term connectome, um, but we thought it's a bit silly. I mean, there were lots of omics, so you had genome and, and proteome. Um, so we thought at that time it's a bit silly, but of course we were wrong. So, so one year later, Olaf um, in his own article was, was basically then proposing the term connectome and nowadays everyone is using um, the term connectome for this kind of network in the brain. You can look at, you can look at uh, different <laughs> levels of connectivity. You can look at connections between individual neurons. So you have uh, axonal connections between neurons. You can zoom out a bit and you can look at how different patches of tissue are connected. So for example, links between uh, cortical Marcus, columns. Marcus, just pause uh, yes. for a moment. I forgot to mute everybody. So I'll mute everybody now and then you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, okay. Apologies, I forgot to do that. Okay, so you should, okay. Up, yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so you can also look at links um, between patches of tissues, so in this case, between cortical columns, or you can look at links between different parts of the brain. So you have fiber tracts between different brain regions. And uh, in this talk, I will mostly focus on the level of fiber tracts between brain regions. So really the global connectivity of the brain. So how does the network look like? Oops, I have to go back here. Um, so this is one part of the network. This is only the visual system. You have visual information from the retina uh, going over the lateral genital nucleus and then entering the visual cortex. So you can see V1. And then the information splits up into two pathways. The dorsal pathway is for the position of objects and the movement of objects. And the ventral pathway, so in infrotemporal cortex here, is for object recognition. So what object is it, what color has the object, what shape, and so on. So you have this dorsal and ventral visual pathway. And this is the network you see when you open up a new science textbook. But this is not the real network. The real network looks like this. Um, so it looks a bit more like a microchip, right? I mean, you have lots of wires between the different processing areas. And it's not immediately obvious where the dorsal and the ventral pathway is. Um, so you can use mathematical tools to search for different pathways. And if you use those mathematical tools, you can distinguish the dorsal and ventral pathway in the picture on the Y, but it, it's not, uh, not obvious anymore. So you have lots of connections in the system and those connections go in both directions. So it's not like a computer where you have input and then it goes to higher areas, but you have a lot of feedback uh, connections going to lower areas in the brain as well. So this is only the visual system. But if we then look at the whole brain, you get a picture like this. Uh, so this is connectivity between different parts of the brain. You can get this information for uh, the human brain and for other brains using a special MRI protocol. So you can use a normal MRI scanner in the hospital or in, in, in a research facility and run a special protocol called diffusion sensor imaging. And this can then reconstruct connectivity in the brain. The colors in this image tell you 
the local direction of a fiber. So red means going from left hemisphere to right hemisphere in the other direction. Blue means going from uh, the top to the bottom or the opposite direction. And green means going from the front of the brain to the back of the brain or the opposite direction. Um, I'm not sure, can you see my mouse cursor as well? Uh, okay, so, so if we look at this image here, you can see lots of parallel fibers down here and the cerebellum, so they're all, all going this direction. You can see the spinal cord going down here. You can also see the articulate, articulate uh, fasciculus, so that's basically uh, this, this arrow here between the language areas Broca and Wernicke, and if we wait a bit further, you can see the corpus callosum connecting the two hemispheres. So we can look at this kind of network and we can already get some information about the subject. So we can look at the human brain, for example, and, and we can predict the age of the subject plus minus eight years and the IQ of the subject uh, plus minus five uh, IQ points. And we want to use this information to inform diagnosis and treatment. So can we look at this and can we uh, diagnose dementia early on, for example, or can we predict what drug should be given to a patient in the hospital? So those are some applications that we are working on. But the features we see in those networks are quite similar between different species as well. Um, if we look at data sets, there are now very large data sets available. Uh, the largest project in the world is the UK Biobank project, which is measuring MRI in 100,000 subjects. So those are all subjects aged 40 years to 65 years. We also have uh, genetic data, so genome sequencing, cognitive performance, socioeconomic status, and previous disease history. But the data will also be updated with current and future disease states. So let's say you have someone who has an MRI measurement at the age of 50. If that person gets dementia with the age of 60, this will be recorded in the database. So we then know how did the brain look like 10 years before the onset of the disease. And the hope is of course that we can use this information to predict whether someone will get dementia or Parkinson's disease later on. So at the moment, there are around 50,000 subjects already measured, but within the next couple of years, it will be 100,000 subjects. It's a really a large data set. So we have access to that data and Newcastle is actually one of the three measurement centers in the UK uh, to get those MRI images. So there are a lot of subjects from the Northeast who participated uh, in this study. So possibly more than 15,000 subjects are uh, from, the, from the Northeast. So it's a really nice data set to understand how diseases are originating and progressing. Uh, unfortunately, you can't sign up anymore. So that's, that's all over because it, it all started a few years ago with 500,000 subjects uh, who had uh, blood samples and, uh, to use genome sequencing. And then out of those 500,000, 100,000 were selected to have MRI scans as well. So in this talk, I will discuss the organization of connectomes, the evolution of neural systems, uh, the development of brain networks, what are some principles of how our brains are developing, and then introduce how connectomes change in health and disease. So how do they change during uh, brain development in childhood and adolescence, and how do they change if people get um, dementia later on? And finally, I will introduce one example how we can use network information to think about planning interventions for brain disorders. So in this example, I will look at epilepsy surgery. Starting with the organization of connectomes, many different species or basically all species have properties in common. So, so whether you look at uh, the fruit fly, uh, whether you look at the mouse or whether you, you look at the rhesus monkey, you get the same principles for the network organization. In all those organisms, we have many long distance connections between parts of the brain, uh, more long distance connections than would be expected in such a system. We have imbalanced connectivity. So, so in many cases, 
if you have a connection going from mu1 a to mu1 b, the connection in the opposite direction might be a lot weaker or it might even be absent. So the current uh, uh, knowledge on the human brain, for example, is that around 85% of the fiber tracts in the brain are bidirectional, but you have 10 to 15% of uh, the fiber tracts that are unidirectional. And this makes a big difference because it gives more degrees of freedom how the system can be organized. Okay. So if you have a bidirectional uh, connectivity, um, you have uh, fewer degrees of freedom. But if you have unidirectional, you can basically decide whether you want a co connection from A to B or from B to A. Okay. So it possibly enables uh, more brain functions that can be implemented by having this imbalance in connectivity. Another feature we find in all brain networks is that of a modular architecture. Modules are parts of networks with many connections within modules, so in this red module, for example, and few connections to the rest of the brain. And this really helps with network function. You can have one module in the brain that is focusing on visual processing. So there are lots of connections within the visual module, but there are fewer connections to other parts of the brain. So you don't get interference with the auditory system, for example, or the motor system. So modular organization is something that all organisms have in common. And finally, you have an organization with hubs and ridge clubs. Hubs are highly connected nodes. So those are brain regions with uh, many connections. And ridge club means that there are stronger connections between hubs. Okay. So because hubs are highly connected, they're often a shortcut to move in, in the network. Okay. So if you want to move from a Newcastle airport to any other place, you possibly will go over a network hub like Amsterdam or Paris or, uh, well, hopefully not London Heathrow. But um, so, so basically you will have uh, some highly connected airports if you want to go from A to B. And the idea is that it's similar in the brain, that you have some highly connected parts of the brain where you can easily go from one part of the brain uh, to another one. So how did this happen in terms of evolution? If we start with simple organisms uh, like uh, Cnidaria, that are very old in evolutionary terms, you have two different stages of the organism. You have uh, the polyp stage where the organism is basically attached to the, to the sea floor here and you have a food that is basically just streaming into the stomach. Uh, so you see this little tentacles and, and then you have food inside uh, the stomach here. And you have another stage, where the medusa stage, where the organism is basically uh, floating in the water. Okay. For this polyp stage, you have a very simple organization of the nervous system. You have something we call a nerve net. So this means that you have a mesh of neurons that are just on the surface of the organism. Okay. So you have nearby neurons that are connected and they just form a mesh in the system. And this makes sense because all that the nervous system is doing is basically sending impulses through the whole uh, nerve net leading to a contraction of the organism. So, so you either stream in water or you pump out water. So it's a, it's a very simple function of the system. We can represent this in different ways. Um, so you can arrange all the new ones on a circle. Okay, so it's, it's not representing the, the spatial position in the organism, but it's representing the topological organization. So which new ones are connected to which other new ones? Okay. So they're all arranged on a circle and in a nerve net, it means that you have nearby new ones that are also connected. So you can see that uh, there are other new ones nearby and this new one will connect to those other new ones here. Another way to represent this is in this matrix here where you have uh, all the new ones. Okay, so let's say you have the new ones on this axis and uh, the new ones on this axis. And if you have a black dot here, it means, let's say in, in, in this case here, that new one number 15 is connected to new one number 17. 
Okay, so just another way to represent uh, this information. But then during evolution, we get a specialization of the system. So in the nerve net, all neurons have the same function, but then you get organisms where you have uh, specialized functions for neurons. So we then get a modular organization. Uh, one example is uh, the nematode, the roundworm uh, C. elegans, uh, Cernoabditis elegans, where we have clusters of neurons, which are called ganglia. And each cluster of neuron has a different function. So you have one ganglion um, that is responsible for, uh, for the mouth part of, of the elegans, so to say. Um, there are other uh, ganglia responsible for digestion, the other ganglia more responsible for movement. So you get this specialization of the system. And in this representation here, it means that you have many connections within this module. So you have one module at the top and one module at the bottom, and you have relatively fewer connections between those two modules. And again, this is another representation here where we have many connections within this upper left module, but fewer connections to the rest of the network. And again, many connections in the lower right module and uh, fewer to the rest of the network. If we go further during evolution, we get an even further specialization. So if we think about the visual system before, the visual system would be one module, but we then have sub-modules within the module. So we have the dorsal pathway for position and the ventral one for object recognition. So what we then get is a hierarchical organization. So we have at the first level different modules, and then we go down another level and we have modules within modules, and then modules within those modules and so on. So we have a hierarchy in terms of the modular organization. And this is something we see in higher organisms, in, in primates, for example, that we have a further specialization within uh, modules. So in this case here, it's maybe not, not that easy to see, but I mean, you have the upper module and then uh, on the left and right hand side, you have some, some smaller modules within the top module here. Uh, so in this case, you have the, the upper module here and then you have two smaller modules within and within those two smaller modules again you have two smaller modules inside okay so we have a nested hierarchy of modular organization so how are those features arising during development so that's individual development of the organism we can think about different mechanisms that could play a role in network development okay so if you think about uh, temporal factors and in terms of the timing you have uh, the birth time and migration time of new ones in the brain you might have different times for axogenesis so when is a new one establishing uh, an axon and establishing uh, synapses here you also have spatial factors uh, in, in terms of how are axons uh, growing in space are they growing in a, in a straight line you have distance dependent guidance so you could have some molecular factors that are attracting axons. Okay, so, so you can see this axon is going to the source of this factor. You can have other factors that are repulsive, so they are basically um, meaning that the axon is going away from the source of that, that factor. You also have uh, fasciculation, so you have some pioneer fibers that are established early on, and other fibers that are just attaching to those existing fibers and just following them. Okay. So that makes it a lot easier. So you just have some new ones that establish a connection and all the other new ones just need to follow that axon and, and go to the right target. So how are those different mechanisms linked to network features? And I, I will only discuss uh, a few examples here. One model that, uh, that I established is the old gets richer model. So the idea that early nodes are more highly connected. Um, so if you have the time axis here, you have some nodes that are generated early on during brain development. And those are also nodes that are evolutionary older. Um, so you, you might have heard this term reptilian brain, you know, so those uh, subcortical structures and, and uh, cerebellum and so on. So those are all parts of the brain that develop early, early on. And then you have other parts of the brain that occur later, uh, neocortex, especially extending in, in uh, primates. And those are parts of the brain 
that are forming later on during individual development. So in this old gets richer model, the basic idea is that uh, the old nodes are established early on and they start connecting to other nodes. Um, th they can't connect to those nodes here because they're not there yet, okay, but they are the, they're connecting to some, to some other nodes here. And at some point they finish connecting to other nodes, okay, so there's a certain, certain gap here then when they just stop connecting. And then you have later nodes that are forming, okay, so, so those nodes in the middle, they can connect to those older nodes. And then you have nodes that are established uh, at the end of brain development, a very, a very late stage, and they can connect to all the nodes that have been established earlier. Um, but the nodes that have been established earlier are less likely to connect to the younger nodes because they already finished establishing connections. Okay. So you have uh, this kind of pattern here that old nodes, they can still connect to those ones, but not to those ones anymore. But the ones that are established at the end, they can connect to all pre-existing nodes here. So we would expect that older nodes are more highly connected because they can get connections from all other nodes that are generated later on. Unlike for the younger nodes that I can't connect, uh, can't get those connections here. And we would also expect that older nodes receive uh, more incoming connections. Okay. We can then test that with real data sets. Um, so the first part is that older nodes should be more highly connected. And this is something we see in uh, C. elegans. So if we look at the birth time of neurons in C. elegans, you can see that most uh, neurons are born relatively early on, around 800 minutes. You have uh, the hatching time of C. elegans, and you still have quite a lot of neurons that are born after hatching. Okay, so it's not, um, it's not the end here. And you can then look at the degree of those new ones at the adult stage. So how many connections um, does each new, a new one have? And you can see for the older nodes that are born early on before hatching, you have some highly connected nodes here. So some new ones that have more than uh, 40 connections, they are connected to more than 40 other new ones. And you don't see that for the late developing ones. So it is basically true that the HARP new ones, the highly connected new ones, are the ones that are the oldest ones in the system, the ones that are generated uh, early on. The second prediction was that you have an imbalance in connectivity, that older nodes should get more incoming connections. And this is something we see in the Rezos monkey. So if we look at very old structures, uh, archicortex, uh, paleocortex, so really those uh, subcortical structures like hippocampus, amygdala, uh, and, and so on, they have 25 fiber tracts going to uh, newer structures, parietal lobe and occipital lobe, and 36 uh, going back. So you have a slight imbalance here, okay? So there are a bit more connections going backwards to those older nodes. If we look uh, within the cortex here, we again have a slight imbalance, okay? So there are more um, connections going backwards to older nodes and going forwards. But if we look at the extreme ends, so basically the newest parts of the brain and the oldest parts of the brain, you have 66 fiber tracts going towards the newer parts, but 100 fiber tracts going to the older parts. So you can really see this imbalance in terms of connections going to older parts of the brain. What we also see is that axons normally grow in a straight line. Um, of course, there were ways to change that. We could have factors that attract or repulse axons when they grow, and we can have barriers like the uh, bones, for example. So there can be limits to, to straight growth, but the default would be to grow in a straight line, and then you have um, some extensions of those axons searching for potential targets. So what we see in the brain is that most connections go to nearby parts of the brain and fewer go to further away parts of the brain. So you see this, this kind of distribution here. And we see that at different levels. We see that at the level of connections between brain regions, 
but we also see that at local patches of tissue. If you only have one cube millimeter of tissue, you see the same distribution. It's more likely to connect to nearby new ones than to further away new ones. And this can be explained with this model here. And I think this is the only equation in here, so it's uh, sorry for that. But anyway, um, so, so the idea is that an exon is, is growing from this new one over here. Uh, the first step, it's an empty uh, unit here, so there is no other new one to connect to. The second step, still there's no other new one to connect to. And in the third step, uh, there's finally another new one to connect to. So it basically takes three steps for this new one uh, to connect to. And we can formalize that uh, mathematically. So we can say, okay, um, this can be represented by one time the probability to uh, get into a cell that contains a new one, probability P. So that's the last step here. And then N minus one steps with probability Q to have an empty cell, okay. Um, so we get this distribution here, and this is basically a binomial distribution. It's, it will look like a, a distribution you see over here. So this basically means that if you look at this pattern, that it's more likely to bump into a near, near, nearby new one than to go for the tissue and only connect to a new one that is further away. So in other terms, just imagine you're at a party. I mean, it's difficult to imagine in, in times of COVID, but uh, so, so, so let's just imagine you're in, in, a, in a party and there are lots of people in the room and you just want to go from one end of the room to the other end of the room and you go in a straight line. It will be a lot more likely to bump into someone relatively early on than to go to the end of the room without bumping into anyone and just bumping into someone at the other end of the room. Okay. So the idea is that it's exactly the same for new ones. It's more likely to connect to a new one nearby than not to make a connection and only to connect to a far away new one. Okay. Um, what you see at the bottom is the role that straight growth can play in establishing connections. Um, so I was basically testing what happens if we don't have growth in a straight line for an exon. So you see in blue, you have a straight line, but for the other curves, you basically have a probability uh, that the new one will change direction at each step. Okay, so it can uh, it can slightly bend uh, for the orange line. Um, it can change direction more dramatically for the yellow line, and even more for the purple line here. Uh, can even go in circles. And what happens then is that it takes longer time to find another new one. Okay, so if we look at uh, the exon length it's increasing the more direction change we allow during exon growth. And the reason for that is, as you can see for the purple line, if you allow a lot of direction change, you have a high likelihood that you're going through parts of the brain that you already visited, okay? So you have been here already, you already know there is no new one there, but you go there anyway because of this, uh, this random change in directions. Okay, so that's why on average it takes longer for those curved uh, axons to find the target. But if you go in a straight line, you always grow into a part of the brain that you haven't seen before. So it's more likely to, uh, to then uh, de detect a new one there. Another factor we have for brain development is that of scaling because a lot of long distance connections are established early when the nodes are still nearby. Okay. So if we look at the discrete time steps in, uh, in C elegance and the percentage of connection pairs uh, that are present, you can see that for, uh, for the short connections, you have, um, you have many connections that are there already and for, uh, for the medium connections. But if you look at the long connection, so this middle curve here, you have 70% of the uh, connections are already present at this time before hatching. So they're present at a time when the organism is only 20% of the final size. So the idea uh, what happens is that you establish a connection early on between new ones that are nearby, and then the whole organism is growing. So what happens is that those two new ones are then 
further apart. Okay, so so when you establish the, the connection, it's not a long distance connection, but in the adult animal, it is a long distance connection. So the axon is not, not whipping apart or something, but it's basically extending into a long distance connection. But at the time of establishment, it's easy to establish because the new ones are basically nearby. Um, and finally, another mechanism is that of time windows. So you have different parts of the brain developing at different uh, time points. Um, and then the idea is that they develop at different time points because they have different uh, heritage, a diff uh, uh, no, they have the similar uh, lineage. Okay, so they have similar genetic information, similar birth times, uh, they're spatially nearby, and because of that, they also tend to establish connections. So if we have those um, three different starting points, the plus signs here, you have lots of other new ones that are generated from those starting points. They inherit the same time windows for establishing synapses, and this then leads to different time windows for establishing synapses, and it leads to different modules as a result of those different time windows. So those are all different mechanisms that can lead um, to the organization we see at the adult stage in terms of long distance connectivity, in terms of highly connected nodes, hubs, and in terms of modular organization. So it gives us some idea what might happen during normal development, but it's also an idea we can test for what happens in brain diseases. So if we know that the network is changed for schizophrenia or for epilepsy, we can think about potential mechanisms that can lead to those changes. So how do connectomes change in health and disease? Um, the basic idea is to understand the factors that lead to new developmental diseases. So we looked at factors previously so we can think about one axis, uh, the age, let's say from before birth up to 20 years, and another axis for different features we want to look at, uh, like gyrification, that is the, the folding pattern of the brain, um, cortical thickness, so how thick is the gray matter in different parts of the brain, and uh, connectivity. So you can think about one trajectory, one pathway for healthy brains, how the system is changing, and another pathway for brain diseases leading to epilepsy, schizophrenia, or Tourette syndrome, or other diseases. So we can use computer models to understand what factors lead to different pathways, and we can then compare this to what trajectories you see if you do studies uh, in human subjects. And ideally, on the long term, we want to predict how to treat patients based on those models. So how can we get the brain's back to normal in a sense. So how can we get closer to the structure we see in healthy brains? Um, so this could be uh, surgery, or it could be brain stimulation, or it could be other interventions uh, to get back to, uh, to normal. So we started by looking into a healthy brain development. Um, so that's work done by a uh, PhD student, Saul Lim from South Korea, uh, who's, who's now a postdoc in Cambridge. And she looked at how the brain is, is changing between the age of four years uh, to 40 years. Okay. And what we found is that in general, you have a reduction in connectivity during brain maturation. So you have a lot more connection in, in children than you have in, in adults. Um, so you're, you're basically we're moving some connections that are, that are not useful and you just get rid of them during, during childhood and adolescence. Um, but what we found is that it's not a random loss of connection. So it's not that you just prune away randomly 10% of, of, of the connections, but it's a preferential loss. So you're basically losing a streamlines a connections within thick fiber tracts. You're losing a short distance connections. You're losing connections within modules, within hemispheres. So if we turn that around, connections between hemispheres stay intact and connections between modules stay intact and very weak fiber tracts stay intact as well. So you're not cutting away a whole fiber tract, but you're reducing the very big fiber tracts. Okay. And this can all help with brain function. You still have 
interaction between modules, let's say between a visual and auditory processing, but you just reduce connections within modules and this might make it easier to process uh, the information. What we also found in the study is that this loss of, of streamlines, this loss of connections starts a bit earlier in girls than in boys during the teenager years. Um, so we have a difference of, of um, uh, two to four years in, in, in terms of this pattern here. And this might explain why girls made sure a bit uh, a bit earlier than, than boys during the teenager years. Um, but basically it's, it's a difference we see in terms of how fiber tracks change. And maybe this might be a reason why some psychiatric diseases are more common uh, in uh, males and females or the other way around. There's just something to think about that we have different time windows um, in, in those different genders here. If we look at the other end of development, so what happens at old age, we can look at dementia progression. Um, so we know that one, one sign of dementia is amyloid beta deposits, so malformed proteins. And those proteins are basically um, traveling through the brain. Uh, it's still an argument whether they just travel through fiber tracks, whether they travel outside fiber tracks, there are different uh, opinions there. Uh, in our opinion, it's, it's mainly through uh, the fiber tracks. But you basically have different stages of how the, uh, the spreading is going on. You have a starting point in hippocampus and other uh, old and, and, and subcortical structures, and then it's spreading more and more into the neocortex, reaching more and more brain regions. And what we find is what in computer science is called a graceful degradation. Um, so graceful degradation in artificial neural networks that, that are used in computer science means that uh, you can damage a large proportion of the network before you see a deficit in function. So if you have a neural network that is trained for pattern recognition, so let's say you have a neural network trained for object recognition. If you have a, a visual image of text and you want to recognize the text, for example, um, you can knock out more than 20% of the network before you see any visible uh, deficit in terms of pattern recognition. So, so those networks are very robust. It's, it's gracefully uh, degradating. And you see the same pattern in humans. If you think about Parkinson's disease, there was one particular part of the brain, a substantia nigra, um, where cells are dying, but you only see symptoms of Parkinson's disease like, like tremor and, and other, other movement deficits when half of the cells are already dead. Okay, um, so, so basically you have 20% 20, 20 of the cells dead, uh, you don't see anything, 40%, you don't see anything, but then at, at the 50% level, you see a deficit. And it's similar for Alzheimer's disease. You have changes starting at the age of 40, but you only see the symptoms in patients when they hit the age 60. Okay. Um, but this also means that there might be a way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease early on. And even though at the moment we don't have treatments, in the future there might be some treatments for Alzheimer's disease that could prevent or slow down the progression uh, towards the disease. So it's important to um, to have some idea about uh, Alzheimer diagnosis. So here you see one example. This is just a work by, uh, uh, by colleagues reported uh, last year, where they just look at the volume of different structures uh, in the brain. So you can see hippocampus, um, lateral ventricles, and an amygdala. And you can see that there were changes visible if you look at uh, control subjects, uh, okay, uh, so CN here. If you look at mild cognitive impairments, so those are subjects that already show some, some memory deficits and many of them are progressing towards Alzheimer's disease and then you have uh, patients with full-blown uh, dementia. And you can see changes that are already visible at a very early stage around the age of, uh, of 40. So years before you have an actual onset of symptoms in patients. So in our lab, we looked into this in terms of brain connectivity, and we developed a computer model 
to detect those changes early on. Uh, unfortunately, we, we still were not able to test it in, in patients because you don't have many patients with, uh, with MRI scans 10, 20 years earlier. Um, but in the future, we will look at the UK Biobank and more and more of those Biobank uh, subjects will develop dementia over the next five to 10 years. So we will be able to test this model um, in, in detail. But what we did is we first looked at how the network differs in old age between healthy subjects and dementia patients. So we identified some features that differ between those patients. So those are some signatures here between uh, um, patients and controls and, and basically the color tells you how strong the difference is in those parts of the brain between uh, controls and, and dementia patients. And we then have a computer model of the progression of dementia. So we have two different groups. We have healthy subjects at the age of, of uh, 40 to 50 um, in this group and in this group here. And for one group, we have the normal aging model. So we just simulate how fiber tracts are changing over time. And the sad truth is uh, that uh, you have some fibers uh, that are getting reduced. Okay, so, so fiber tracts as in, in early development um, are, are shrinking. So you have a shrinkage in, in those fiber tracts, you have a loss of, of fibers uh, in the network. But then we also looked at a model that has the normal aging plus the progression of dementia, where you have those proteins moving between different parts of the brain, uh, killing cells, and as a result, killing the exons as well. And as a result, you have a stronger reduction in connectivity in the brain. And we then look at this model over 15 years and we check can we detect any significant uh, differences between normal aging and uh, dementia? So you can see for the early stages on the right hand side, classification is, is not very good. So it's just below chance level. Um, but at later stages, we get above significance. So we can basically um, correctly predict whether a subject is on the pathway towards dementia, or whether a subject is on the pathway of normal aging. So we can basically do that three to five years before the onset of symptoms. And this is something we want to test in the future with real clinical data sets. We currently have a project um, together with South Korea to basically develop those uh, computer models. And we can, in the computer model, test different starting regions. Um, so we can pick one of the nodes and say, this is a starting point for, for progression. And we can then check if we look at the spreading pattern, which spreading pattern is most similar to the one we see in those dementia patients in the clinic. So we can look at the distance to dementia brain alterations. And you can see that for those regions here, hippocampus, amygdala, and terminal cortex, we get the lowest distance to the actual patient. So, so this gives us the most realistic models. And this is really reassuring because those structures are also the ones that are clinically and experimentally supposed to be the starting points of dementia. Okay, so it's basically a kind of a sanity check whether our computer models are, are realistic and we see the same uh, starting points in our model than uh, we see in, in actual patients. So finally, we can use those models to plan interventions for brain disorders. I will just look at one example, which is epilepsy. Uh, epilepsy affects around 1% of the population in the UK. And unfortunately, the drugs don't work for many subjects. Um, for one third of the epilepsy patients, uh, the drugs don't work, so they still have epileptic seizures. And in those cases, the only remaining option is brain surgery, which means rem removing parts of the brains which can be a quite large part of the brain. Uh, there's one example of a boy in, uh, in Germany, 15 years old, where half of the brain was removed during surgery. Um, and it gets even worse. So, so you basically have brain surgery and in one third of the cases, the surgery doesn't work. So you still have the, the same amount or almost the same amount of, of seizures uh, that you had before. 
Uh, so in order to uh, inform surgery, we developed a computer model of, of what is going on. Um, that was developed by uh, Peter Taylor and Francis Hutchings. And this model is simulating seizure spreading in the brain. So we have information about how the brain of epilepsy patients is connected. So we know about fiber tracts um, between different regions of the brain. And the weight in the computer model then depends on the strength of the fiber tract. And we simulate oscillations in the system. So in this case here, you have relatively small oscillations at the beginning, but then later on you have large scale oscillations and we would say that those are epileptic seizures. So there's epileptic activity in that part of the brain. We can measure how long it takes of, um, for the transition from normal behavior to epileptic behavior. We, we call that the escape time. So this shows one simulation here. We just have eight different regions we're measuring from and you can see normal behavior over time, but then one of the regions is just starting to show this epileptiform activity over here. So you can see large oscillations in this region. And over time, this is spreading to other parts of the brain. So you can see that other parts of the brain are showing large scale oscillations as well. And based on our computer model, we can then predict which parts are the starting points that should be removed during epilepsy surgery. So in this case, we would say that, well, this node here is starting first. So this node over here, which means that this should be the part of the brain uh, that should be removed during epilepsy surgery. So we basically find that the regions that are indicated in our computer model are also the regions that are often removed during surgery in those patients. So there was a correspondence between our model and, and what is actually uh, removed in, in patients. But we then went one step further and wondered whether we can actually predict whether surgery works or not in individual patients. We were extending this with a different kind of information. So, uh, okay, maybe it looks a bit uh, shocking here. So, so what you see is um, the skull is removed uh, in, in the human and you see an implanted grid of electrodes that is just on top of the brain. So it's not sticking into the tissue, but it's just on top of the brain, recording information. And those implanted electrodes are used to pinpoint down where the starting points are and, and what parts of the brain should be removed. So you implant them, um, you, you put the skull back and you basically have them implanted for, um, for a couple of weeks. You have the patient in the hospital for a week or so, and then you just uh, measure seizures and you try to find out where they are coming from, where the starting point is. Um, and we were getting information about those recordings here, getting information about which electrodes are activated at the same time. So we call that uh, functional connectivity. And we were then running computer models to predict where the starting points are. And the important point is that uh, our models don't rely on seizure activity. So if you have a patient in the hospital, you might need to wait for several days until you have a seizure uh, or you have enough seizures to, to pinpoint down where the starting point is. But for our model, we don't need any seizures. So we can just have the patient in the hospital for one day, there's no seizure occurring and we can make a prediction where the starting point is. Uh, so that's a huge, huge benefit of this kind of model. So how well is the model performing. Um, to give you an example, we have uh, two different patients here. One patient where surgery was successful, so the patient is seizure-free after surgery, and one case where surgery was unsuccessful. Um, you can see the implanted grid on the brain here, and the black electrodes signify electrodes um, above brain tissue that was removed during surgery. Okay, so, so this part is taken out. And the color tells you what our model would predict where the starting point of seizures is. So, so what part of the brain should be removed. Um, so red means that our model says there's a high likelihood that this is a starting point. And you can see a complete overlap between our computer model and the actual surgery for this patient. And, and this patient was seizure free. 
But for this other patient here, there is no overlap at all between what our computer model says is the starting point and what was removed by the surgeons. And you have no, um, no overlap at all. And as a result, you have still seizures after the surgery. So how often did that occur? If you look at the complete cohort of patients, if our computer model predicts that this surgery will be successful, in 100% of the cases, the surgery was successful. But if our computer model says that uh, this surgery will be unsuccessful, in 73% of the cases, the surgery is really unsuccessful. In 27% of the cases, the surgery is successful. So our computer model says there's a problem, there's a really strong case to, uh, to rethink the surgery and to also think about alternative parts of the brain that might be targets for the surgery. Uh, so we are currently uh, in discussions with University College London Hospitals, it's basically the largest center for epilepsy surgery together with, with King's, um, to basically try this in patients uh, to get a better idea where to remove brain tissue in order to have a successful outcome of surgery. Um, so there's more information in, uh, in, in the book, of course. So, so that book came out uh, last week. Um, it's currently reduced on Amazon, uh, 27 pounds. Um, and it, it basically talks in more detail about how the brain is organized as a network, how the brain develops and uh, gets different network features, and also how the brain is uh, changing. So basically talking about healthy brain development, talking about developmental diseases uh, like schizophrenia, depression, uh, talking about epilepsy, Tourette's syndrome, autism, so all kinds of diseases, how they develop, how the network changes, what the mechanisms could be. It's talking about old age diseases like Parkinson's and dementia. It's also talking about how we can change the network. So change can be learning. Um, it uh, can tra be change in lifestyle. So for example, we know that people who are more active at old age and socially active, meeting other people, they're less likely to develop dementia. Uh, if you learn a second language, you're also less likely to, to develop dementia. So there are certain things that might Im improve uh, cognitive function at, at old age as well. And there's also one chapter on brain stimulation, which is a really novel way to change the network and to change network dynamics. And in the future, there will be a lot more applications replacing drugs with brain stimulation because brain stimulation can target one particular part of the brain, whereas drugs, once they are through the blood-brain barrier, they can just go anywhere. Uh, so they're not only changing activity in the desired part of the brain, but also in other parts of the brain. And this is one reason why you have huge side effects for pharmaceutical drugs. And so one epilepsy patient put it in a way, so he said that um, if the side effects of anti-epileptic drugs uh, would be on their own, then it would be classified as another disease. Um, so basically there are different, different topics here. Uh, finally, I would I'd like to thank uh, my team and, and alumni of my lab who are all involved in, in those studies. Um, so current researchers and, and uh, researchers who now moved on to, uh, to faculty positions. There's more information online on the website uh, and you can also follow me on Twitter to get updates on this kind of research. And I would I'd like to thank my collaborators and the funders who supported this over the last 15 years. So thanks very much for your attention. And I think if there are any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Marcus, for a fantastic talk. That was really fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I'll turn the recording off now. And if mm -hmm. you want to stop sharing your screen and then we'll have a question session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay.